Hello and welcome to tonight's event from the British Library presented in partnership with Penguin Live. I'm Brett Walsh of the Cultural Events Department and I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation on the wonder of birds. Now we've got a stellar panel for you tonight but before I hand over to them I have a few points of housekeeping. Below the video you will find a form where you can submit questions. We'll be running a Q&A session towards the end of the event. You can also find links to buy all of the books that we'll be discussing tonight and those links are also below the video. Now chairing tonight's discussion is Kitty Corrigan. She is a freelance writer and journalist living in the Welsh borders. Before moving to Hay on Wye, she was based in London, where she was the deputy editor of Country Living magazine for 16 years. She has a special interest in climate and environmental issues, and I've no doubt she'll be an excellent chair for tonight's event. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Kitty. Thank you. Hello and welcome. And we're going to start tonight's session with a reading by Bill Bailey from his book. And I should just explain that his book is, a, is designed in a slightly unconventional way. It's in the form of a scrapbook written with a vintage typewriter with all sorts of different colored ribbons and bits and bobs stuck in with paper clips and, and yellowed uh, sticky tape. So um, it's not like your, your average book and it's also got all his own illustrations. So here he is to read from the introduction. Hello everyone, Bill Bailey here. Uh, I'll be reading a few extracts from my book, uh, Remarkable Guides of British Birds. And a bit later, I'll be taking a couple of questions from the other speakers. This is the, in, the actual introduction from my book. Uh, so here we go. Once during a walking holiday in the jungles of Indonesia, I asked an old friend, Victor, who has lived in the tropics for 40 years, if there was anything he missed about Britain. The colors, he said. Everything in the tropics is exotic, vivid, in your face. I miss the muted shades of Britain, the autumn, and mostly the delicate, subtle colors of British birds. It's true, in those latitudes, there is a profusion of color to the point of gaudiness, where the exotic becomes commonplace. Vic's hankering for drabness stuck in my mind. And when I got home, I found myself taking another look at the birds I've grown up watching in my back garden. Every shade of brown, every heathery hue, sparked off a renewed appreciation of our own more dowdy avian companions. And yet, the iridescence of a starling, the bright jewel that is a goldfinch, the tiny flash of electric blue on a jay's wing. Our native birds still dazzle, albeit in an understated way. Not as spectacular as a bird of paradise perhaps, but just as beautiful and a lot easier to see. So this is my scrapbook, 51 of my favorite British birds. Most of them are fairly common, some less so, but they all have something remarkable about them. Birds are all around. And the more you discover them, the more they will entertain and delight you. Thank you. And we're going to hear more from Bill later on. But I'm going to start um, the questions with Helen MacDonald, um, author of Vesper Flights. Um, Helen, Bill, in his book, he dedicates it to his parents who instilled in him a love of the natural world. And it sounds as if you had a similar experience. Uh, you grew up in a large walled estate, a uh, parkland, um, where you were able to roam free and explore. But you were also bullied at school. And so nature was one way of seeking refuge can you tell us a little bit more about your childhood and, and how you became so involved with the natural world? Yeah, I had this really bonkers childhood. Um, my parents were both kind of hard bitten journalists, wonderful people. And they bought this tiny little house on an estate owned by the Theosophical Society, this sort of really 
quite esoteric 19th century spiritual society. And, and uh, it was very safe. It was kind of crumbling, crumbling ruin of a place. And I spent a lot of time out on my own watching birds and looking for animals. And it was a real kind of, I don't know, a hunt for companionship. You know, I used to turn over rocks. My parents would get cross with me. I used to destroy the rockery every morning looking for bugs, you know. Um, and I think it's like really lovely. You know, we so often think of nature as something we should test ourselves against or compare ourselves against or sort of conquer. But it was very much like, you know, me, I wanted to learn the names of all these animals the same way I wanted to learn the names of my friends at school. They were kind of family to me. And that really got me into being a naturalist, that just constant exposure to the natural world. It was, um, it was a refuge, but it was also a place of safety. Yeah, it was really great. So your previous book, H is for Hawk, it won so many awards. How, how was it, how did it feel to then sit down and start another book? Did you give yourself time to reflect or did you start right away? Yeah, I know, right, the difficult, difficult second album syndrome. I didn't expect the first book to do well at all. It was an extraordinary surprise. Um, so a lot of the things in this book, a lot of them were commissions for um, newspapers and magazines, like the New York Times magazine. So I already had some written, and a lot of those were written sort of late at night in hotels while I was on tour, you know. I used to joke with my publishers about, you know, maybe the subtitle could be, you know, 3 a.m. weeping in hotel rooms. Um, but my tour took me to many different parts of the world and I got to see nature and particularly birds all over the place. And I thought to myself, there's something about the essay form that I really love. They always feel to me a bit like a conversation with a reader rather than a sort of a lesson, you know, they're, they're me finding things out about the natural world and our place in it. And I just thought it would be really lovely to kind of collect them together and make this thing that was like a kind of a, a cabinet of wonders. Um, I think what I'm trying to do is just get across the astonishing diversity and wonder of the natural world to readers. And I hope that I've done that in its pages. I, I, I expected the book Vesper Flights to be all about birds, but in fact, there's lots of different animals and also different subjects. I mean, there's one essay about a Syrian refugee and one about having migraines. You travel to Chile, Hungary, Turkey, you talk about volcanoes and deserts. So how did you decide to pick which topics for that collection and, to, and in what order you should um, place them. Yeah. yeah, there is a whole bunch of different stuff in there. there. I mean, there was a few that didn't go in. There was a big essay on Star Wars that I was told didn't really fit. I was quite grumpy about that. It's like, I really like Star Wars. Um, putting them all in together though, what, what ended up happening was a dear friend of mine, Christina, who's in the book as a wonderful Australian philosopher was visiting. And we just, we just printed out all the essays and put them on this big table I've got in the kitchen and spent a day just sort of swearing and drinking coffee and putting them in order. And I hope that the book has a kind of a story to it. Um, it takes you from um, my very early childhood right the way through my life and then back to my childhood again. So there's a kind of story there, which I hope is, is followable. But also, I don't know, it's, it's been such a grim year and my concentration is absolutely shot. So I'm kind of quite pleased that it's a collection of quite short pieces that you can pick up and put down whenever you want. You know, it's not a, it's not a giant haul through a book. It's mm. taken piecemeal. And I think there are lots of positives in it and lots of hope and humor. The story about the goat, for example, which <laughs> I'll leave um, readers to, to discover that one. Um, I also discovered that you're allergic to a lot of animals, uh, deer, horses, dogs, foxes, and the latter you discovered when you were skinning a roadkill fox to make a rug. And you also um, kept a dead swift in your fridge for a time. Are there any other animals that you've or birds that you've preserved after death. Yeah, yeah, I'm a very gothic naturalist, aren't I? I think I got inspired when I was a, when I was a tiny kid. My parents used to drop me off at the Natural History Museum in London. I think they'd probably be arrested now for doing this. And I used to just wander around the halls and there was this giant display of bits of birds. So lots of different bird feet and different bird beaks. And I was obsessed with the, with the sort of amazing kind of shapes and, and, and meanings of these different objects. So I just assumed that if you were a naturalist, you just collected dead things. And I still sort of do that. I've got, you know, skulls on my mantelpiece and feathers and stuff. So yeah, I'm afraid that's, that's the tradition I, I sit in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think in the old days, uh, naturalists used to sometimes kill a bird to bring it back to the lab to investigate it. So thankfully that's not done now. Um, but you're going to give us a short reading and I think it's the essay called Rescue. Uh, yeah. So yes, let's have that. that would be yeah, nice. this is about a, a dear friend of mine called Judith, who is uh, perhaps Britain's greatest uh, rearer of orphaned swifts. And swifts are a bird that is very important in this book. Um, and when you release a baby swift, you know, they, they're these very cuddly 
amazing things with incredibly long wings and they're very aerial creatures. They live in the sky a bit like herring live in the sea. And you basically hold one on your palm and hold it up into the wind and wait for it to, and it's never flown before and you just have to wait for it to take off. It's an incredibly emotional moment. And this is what it's like. In the bright air, the swift looks a weird unearthly creature, a delicate construction of scalloped feathers and ungainly wings. Hunched into itself, its miniature claws grip my fingers, its deep eyes like reflective astronaut visors. I wonder what it can see. Lines of magnetic force perhaps, rising air and flying insects and a suspicion of summer storms. The flat green grass beneath it has nothing to do with it at all. I lift my hand higher, all I can do now is wait. It stares into the wind for a while, then starts shivering. Anticipation, I think. Functional explanations. This bird is warming up its pectoral muscles ready for flight. Emotional explanations. Anticipation, wonder, joy, terror. Nothing has visibly changed, but something is happening. Like an aircraft avionics system coming online as it powers up. Blinking lights, engine check, check. But that doesn't work though, not quite as an analogy, because what I am watching is a new thing making itself out of something else. There is no doubt in my mind that this is as much a transformation as a dragonfly larva crawling from water and tearing itself out into a thing with wings. On my open palm, a creature whose home has been paper towels and plastic boxes is turning into a different creature whose home is thousands of miles of air. Then, the swift decides. It tilts the pug sharp tiny tip of its beak upwards, arches its back and drops from my flattened palm, making an aching series of stiff and creaky wing beats. For five or six seconds, everything feels wrong. The bird is a mere foot above the grass and my heart is beating fast. Up, 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 calls Judith. But nothing is broken. We're just watching a bird learning to fly. Hitching as if pulling into gear, the swift starts to ascend, flickering up and up into a sky streaked with evening cirrus. It describes one careful circle above our heads, then lifts even higher and straight lines it to the cell. I look down at my palm. There's a little scratch on the meat of my thumb where its claws had gripped tight before letting me go, gripped tight to the hand that was the last solid thing the bird would touch for years. They don't land. They spend two years, approximately, in constant flight. It's an astonishing thing. It was a very emotional moment. Mm, yes, they fly thousands of miles, don't they? And feed on the wing and mate on the wing. Yeah. Um, and that reading fits in very well with the title essay of the book, Vesper Flights, because that, that's about swifts. So uh, is the swift one of your favourite birds? Yeah, they're just so strange. And also they're just, when I was a kid, I used to get really grumpy because I couldn't see them too up close. They were too fast and too mysterious. They, they seemed almost sort of like angels. And um, I think they represent to me everything, that kind of that sense of sort of longing to connect to the natural world that, you know, we can never really know what it's like to be a bird or to, to, to really know what their lives are like. And the world of a swift is so unlike ours. They just seem magical to me. I love them to bits. What, as much as the goshawk, as in H is for hawk? Yeah, goshawks are very different things. So this goshawk I trained, I mean, they have this reputation in falconry as being a bit like kind of, um, they're kind of avian Christopher Walkens, these kind of murderous killers. And of course, animals are always more than you think they are. So I, I discovered quite rapidly that goshawks are actually quite playful and quite cute, as well as being murderous. So I used to actually play with my goshawk. I used to throw her bits of paper scrunched into balls and she'd catch them in her beak and throw them back to me. And um, I told some of my friends who keep goshawks about this and they were all blokes and they're all horrified. You know, you don't play with goshawks. They're kind of like feathered shotguns. And I discovered later they all do play with their goshawks. They just don't like to admit it. So that, that tells us something about people and animals, I think, more than the animals in, in themselves. Mm. But that goshawk is no longer with us. Is that right? Alas, no, yeah, she died very suddenly of a fungal, uh, an airborne fungal infection called aspergillosis. It killed her very quickly. And, you know, it's a very deep and simple sadness. She was really the, you know, the, the hawk of my life. People talk about the dogs of their lives and Mabel was really the hawk of my life. I still miss her. I've got, I've got some of her feathers in a jar um, on my mantelpiece. And I quite often sort of, you know, have a bit of a, bit of a sad moment looking at them. I miss her a lot. But you do um, have a parrot. I don't anymore. This is the saddest thing of all. So I've had the parrot for 18 years and the parrot died uh, a couple of, this is like a terribly sad thing. Oh. The parrot died uh, 
a couple of months ago. And um, it, that's been a proper grief, actually. I think, a, you know, a hawk is a companion um, in the sense, you know, but, but a, a parrot is like a person. And I've really been struggling um, with, the, with the loss of this bird, you know. Um, I, I keep looking up and expecting him to be sitting on the doors swearing at me, you know, and sort of throwing things around the kitchen. But he was an astonishing creature. And I'm, I'm really honored to have spent so many years with him. And he was a very happy, happy creature too. So, um, you know, I don't think I regret anything about the way his life was lived. Mm. And uh, after a period of mourning, are you going to acquire another bird? Because you said that um, the parrot kept you from being lonely, it would sit by your keyboard and help you when you were writing. Yeah, he helped me by helped me quite often by being very key, but quite often he then take possession of the keyboard and insist that I wasn't allowed to type. And then he'd, he'd wrench off keys and fly off with them laughing and drop them in places. So there was a bit of conflict. There may be another parrot at some point, yeah, um, but not for a while. I think I have to honour Burdul, as he was called first. So one day, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you live in the fens. What kind of birds do you see on your um, regular walks? There's a whole bunch of stuff around here now. And in fact, um, you know, lockdown's been really interesting in that I've, you know, I've not been going out far from home looking for birds. I've been looking at the birds in my garden, the commoner birds, and that's been an extraordinary solace. You know, I've got to know individual birds. There's a pheasant um, who comes and taps on my window in the morning demanding food. He's trained me beautifully. Um, there's something about the, the ordinariness and the, you know, the ubiquity of these creatures that has been um, a real joy. Um, you know, I think quite often we expect with nature we have to go out a long way to find it. And there's something about watching a pigeon having a preen or lifting one wing to the rain and enjoying the rain that is, um, it's a very, very simple um, and yet quite a complicated way of feeling that you're part of the natural world. And I, I value it much more now during the pandemic than I used to, that, that, that familiarity and that closeness. Mm. Was there a particular reason why you moved to Suffolk? Um, I've always kind of loved Suffolk. It's, it's a bit of a joke, actually. Suffolk seems, seems to be sort of collecting writers. They're everywhere. You know, you walk down the road and there's just nature writers everywhere. Um, it's a great place. It's, it's, um, it's super friendly. I moved um, further and further from Cambridge. I just said that there's a clothes moth. I have this constant battle with them. You know, I love the natural world, except clothes moths. I don't know where I'm going. Um, but it's a super friendly village. It's, it's, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's on, a, on the end of sort of a, a ridge of chalk. So it's quite high up with the second, village, second highest village in Suffolk. And rather amusingly, my village is called Hawkton. Well, I was going to ask, was that, did that sway you into buying uh, oh, your cottage? Almost the opposite. When I found out it was called Hawkton, I rolled my eyes. I was like, really? You know? <laughs> so yeah, no, it's good. And, and um, you know, I am looking forward to, to venturing out and visiting, you know, different habitats you know I, I miss sort of deep forests I miss the coast and there are parts of the natural world that I really have been mourning the loss of through the pandemic and you know I mean not to try and set that against the terrible things sort of the loss and and, and horror of the, of the of pandemic but in a very personal sense I, I miss some of the things that have been closed to me and I'm looking forward to getting back out there. Mm, thank you okay I'm going to um talk to, to Sam now. Uh, so Sam Lee, uh, you're a conservationist, a musician, folk expert, and you've written a book called The Nightingale, which I must say has got some beautiful illustrations um, in between each chapter. And The Nightingale being, because it's 200 years since the, the death of John Keats, we, we've been hearing about his poetry and of course one of his most famous was Ode to a Nightingale and in that poem it represents anguish and mortality because the poet's brother has just died and you say in the book there, there are lots of different symbols, lots of different representations connected with nightingales. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, indeed. I mean, the, the, the nightingale extends both laterally, geographically in its, uh, in its importance and, and, and iconography, but also through time as well. And for the poets and the writers, every generation took it upon themselves to, to, to approach and to, to question and interpret the nightingale and um, create their own, their own experience into words, but also What's so fascinating is how the nightingale takes on so many personalities within, particularly within folklore and folk song um, across the Northern Hemisphere, the, 
the the boundary of the Nightingale heads all the way out to sort of Western Mongolia. And within the music, the musicality, the the instrumentation throughout um, the 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 far the Near East and throughout Europe, there's an extraordinary array of different personalities that the bird takes on, from the melancholic to the jovial to the highly sexed to the the quizzical. Um, so it's a bird that means so many things to so many different people. Yeah. Um, which is a fascinating thing, aren't many species that can do that, really. Mm. And in the UK, um, we only hear it in England, is that correct? It's not found in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, which I wonder why that is. Well, I mean, that is the territory. We, we're quite extreme for how far, far out west the nightingales appear. Um, they're, they, their range is definitely much more shrunk today uh, and in terms of their... Um, they were once bursting over the borders. They have been heard in Herefordshire and Hale Mwai on the Welsh borders where you are, um, and occasional sightings of them further north, and which became real kind of cultural events actually with uh, wonderful um, uh, historical records of entire villages turning out to go and hear a nightingale that had blown off course. There were tellings of them having landed in Ireland as well. But um, really, they, they, their heartland is down in the southeast. Um, and, you know, the expectation with climate change was that their, their range would, would open up a little bit. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And still, their, their distribution is sh shrinking um, annually. And we're losing them from a lot of those marginal areas, particularly based like Gloucestershire and um, mm. the Midlands, where they're, you know, dipping away quite fast. And is that because of destruction of woodlands or depletion of insects or development generally? It's all of the above. Um, uh, the uh, in, in terrible impact of deer, uh, overpopulation of deer, of course, loss of habitat. We can't take away the, the terrible destruction and cutting down of woodland. A rate of deforestation in, in Britain that's higher than Brazil relative to how much ancient woodland and woodland we have here. Um, also the, the you know, collapse of insects for all sorts of reasons, particularly chemical pesticides and our farming practices are all having their dent, but there's also so many mystical things and, and ways that populations just can't sustain themselves at certain, certain critical levels when they reach too small. They're a very particular bird um, in what they what they need and what they like and actually the thing that you know is is that they love messy scrubby neglected land with overgrown blisters of blackthorn and um, and it's a sort of landscape that uh, our country looks down upon as though it's unused and unloved uh, and I think we've misinterpreted often so much of what nature likes or needs to sort of uh, to, to put it like that so the nightingale thrives in those the kind of the marginal habitats, the, the kind of the the edge lands and and the and the kind of the industrial as, as we were talking about early on. This kind of sometimes it's the most unlikely places. You know, Berlin is famous for having birds that sit on the traffic lights in the Tiergarten outside some kind of throbbing nightclubs, singing away. They love these unusual places and they do love human habitation, but obviously not if there's no dense thicket to live in. Well, let's um, hear a little from the book. You're going to give us a reading. Yeah, with pleasure. Um, so this is, a, this is a part that comes at the end of the book, looking at kind of visions of hope and, um, and success stories as well for the nightingale. It's not all doom and gloom, but this is, this is my vision of a one day. Um, and it's a sort of an impassioned plea of how we may bring the nightingale back into our lives in this very kind of, dare I say, ceremonial sort of way. I have long dreamed there to be one utterly fanciful and romantic way that this call to bond further with nature and the nightingales and all their legacy of appreciation might take hold among friendship groups and families. I like to imagine that one day in a not too distant future, a ritual will exist annually every spring. England having as many nightingales as it did before the 1960s, that is in the hundreds of thousands, 
experiences come early May, an exodus of people from their homes to go and do a nightingale. Families and friends, couples and singletons, grandparents and grandchildren, community groups, work colleagues, whoever it pleases, will gather on gentle dry nights with flasks of hot tea, snacks, maybe even a bottle of port or whiskey, blankets, and at around 9 p.m. will leave their homes or the pub, will drive many hundreds of miles even to head out to a nightingale hotspot. On the journey, there are stories told of when each person first heard his song and how wonderful it will be to hear this bird again after a long cold winter how much the spring has come on this year and how early or late it was and other such seasonal reminiscences and observations. When the destination is reached, a silence will fall upon the group, like when the lights go down at a concert and a hush will reign. Intrepid steps are made into the brush to get close to a bird as quietly as possible. And when he is reached, blankets are spread and everyone cozies up to one another to start listening. I imagine this scene like an English equivalent of a Burns night, but informally arranged on the leafy floor amongst the hyacinthine scent of bluebells. There are kids curled up on parents' laps, friends resting their heads on each other's bellies or leaning back to back. And then, after a while of just listening to the nightingale sing, out of someone's pocket comes an old tattered notebook with scraps of paper. Maybe it's a hand down from a late parent or gifted from a godmother when they were young. A phone light is discreetly turned on and in hushed reverential voices, poems and songs and rounds and prose are recited or sung up towards our nightingale. Every offering is an heirloom received, found or chosen along life's way savoured as being perfect for this annual moment. The opportunity to share something is passed around for anyone who wants to give a sonnet or a recitation. An improvised sharing evolves, unique to those present and to each year's mood. Some sharings are sombre and mournful, others are comical and muted sniggers and full of irreverences. Some are people are, are more formal, others are casual, some are drunk, others are stoned, some are erotic, some are lonely, some are romantic, and some are in remembrance, and some are in prayer. But are all are in celebration of this bird, and of ourselves as sentient, sensitive beings, grateful for what might not have survived. As the night ends and we drowsily make our way home, drunk on nightingale song, and a bit woozy. I like to think that the resounding feeling that everyone goes home with, exclaiming to one another, is not as I hear all the time today, gosh, why don't we do this more often? But more of a, wow, thank you everyone. I'm so pleased we did this every year. Beautiful to hear the, the nightingale <laughs> thing there. One of the fascinating facts in the book is that um, the nightingale has two voice boxes, so it sings with one while it breathes in with the other. Is that is that unique to that species? No, not to that species. That's a, a, a common. That's a, that's how birds are. They have the we have the larynx and they have their syrinxes, and it's this um, essentially two voice boxes on each branch down to their air sacs. Um, and the nightingale isn't necessarily the, the finest dis displayer of, the, of the, the brilliance of what that can achieve. I'd say that probably the skylark is uh, exemplary in that ability to almost circular breathe, to be reciting with one side while taking air in somehow. I'm not entirely sure of the, 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 the biology of that, but there is the ability to, to pass one note of one side onto another. And certainly there are moments with the nightingale, particularly when I'm out with them, as just heard there, um, doing the, the singing with nightingales work and bringing audiences and concert, making a concert with the bird because they are very collaborative that you will hear them hold a note for so long. It is impossible that that's all coming out of one lung. So there is a point of that seamless 
uh, dovetailing of from one side to the other, which is just phenomenal. Because there's this bit where you're listening to me and you think he's going to fall out the tree. He's just going to run out of puff. And he just keeps going and going and going and then going and going. <laughs> Amazing. Um, at this point, I'd just like to um, ask the audience to send in their questions. There's a form that you can fill in at the bottom of the screen. And uh, in the last 10 minutes, we'll um, put as many as we can to Sam and to Helen. Um, so Sam, um, that leads on quite nicely to the song we're all familiar with, The Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square although apparently it might not have been a nightingale, it might have been a wren because it was the wrong time of year. But um, you held an unusual event uh, in Berkeley Square with um, Extinction Rebellion. And I'm wondering why you chose that in particular and what was the reaction of residents, passers-by and perhaps the police? <laughs> well, the police absolutely loved it. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, the um, 2019, during the spring uprising, which was really the birth of that organization, uh, the great coming of age of it, um, uh, during that two weeks of activism to draw attention to the impacts of ecosystem collapse and extinction, um, there was a great uh, emphasis throughout the organization and a lot of the, 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 the actions in, um, in governmental you know, policy and fossil fuels and all the contributing factors. But I wanted to create an event that drew attention to the species that were actually at the heart of the matter. And um, essentially create a, a gathering that paid respect to both species lost, species endangered, and our interconnectedness with these uh, wonderful beings, our brothers and sisters. And, um, I'd long wanted to run an event, a nightingale event, as I do with uh, in Berkeley Square, but they charge fifteen thousand pounds an hour to hire, uh, which is slightly out of my budget. So, um, so taking inspiration from Extinction Rebellion, just turn up and do what you want to do, and their very wonderful display of creativity and community, I I invited people to come and join together in Berkeley Square to sing a rewriting of that song. Um, uh, the idea that we could bring the nightingale back and to rewild the bird, rewild ourselves in many ways. And we spent an evening where everybody, all 1,500 people that turned up, uh, live streamed out of their mobile phones the song of the nightingale. And we filled the square up with the nightingale song and musicians, hundreds of musicians were there and played and poems were recited, a little bit like this bit I was talking about. And for a, for a brief moment on that warm April night, we dreamt what it would be like to really have nature in the heart of our city quite like, like that, although we are very privileged in London in that respect, but how nature could be more integrated in our lives and, and in our hearts in that respect. Um, and it was, a, it was the closing of that two weeks, it was the end of the, the April rebellion. And it was a very special and moment I'll never forget. Mm. Helen, have you ever um, taken part in any kind of action like that or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, you know, people, I'm not very good at writing campaigning prose. Um, other people are much better than that than I am. So I, um, you know, I, I think what I tried to do with the book is to open up a space for uh, wonder and, and, and marvel at the natural world and open up a space for hope to the sense that not everything is fixed, and that that takes some work to try and maintain hope in in today's world. But yeah, I mean, you know, I say it in the book. I mean, you know, we have to march and fight and sing. We have to do that. You know, we can't just sit around. If you're if you're too optimistic about the fate of the natural world, then you don't do anything because you think it's going to be fine. And if you're too pessimistic, then you don't do anything because you think it's it's there's no point. So you need to open up that space for possibility and I think yeah we need we need to get together we need to to to, to fight and make our voices loud. Mm. I think there are a lot of positives in in the book uh, as I say we don't want doom and gloom all the time otherwise you would just give up but you give one example with your Irish background of uh, going to Dublin and finding peregrine falcons in an industrial wasteland they were perfectly happy there. 
Yeah, they're everywhere now. In fact, um, last time I saw a peregrine, you know, it wasn't in the Scottish mountains. It was on, on St Pancras. You know, I, I heard a, a this is obviously a year ago now. I haven't really been traveling very much, but it, you know, there was a there was a male, a falcon, sort of sitting on top of them roof, just sort of making these wonderful kind of courtship sort of chopping noises, and it was just like you know, it was just marvelous. Um, you know, the Dublin one, they, 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 in the city, I went there with my friends Hillary and, and Eamon, and Eamon talks about how in the city, you know, you can look up, you can look up during the day, you can be caught up in the kind of everyday sort of turmoil of, of, of trying to make a living and, you know, the sort of everyday human kind of stresses, and you look up and you see a peregrine over Temple Bar, and suddenly he said it's like a, a bit of eternity, you know, it doesn't just make you feel excited to have seen a peregrine it, it it can change the way you look at your city because it's home to a creature that you so would normally ex you know you'd expect them to be in these you know barren wilderlands and, and cliffs and, and, and sea cliffs and, and mountains but there they are as happy as anything feasting on pigeons you know tearing heads off pigeons and, yes. <laughs> and it's really very 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 true. okay so now we're going to go back to bill bailey um and before we take questions from the audience, but keep sending them in. And we sent um, some questions to Bill in advance. So here we're going to hear his answers. Okay, here's a few questions I've received. Here's one. Are you a twitcher or a birder? Well, I can say with a degree of certainty, I am a birder. Uh, I'm not a twitcher. Um, I think... As far as I understand it, that indicates a level of commitment that perhaps I'm I'm not at yet. <laughs> I might well become one, I suppose, over the years, but at the moment I would say I'm a birder. For me, a twitcher is someone who is has got a pager on them at all times, and they might be in the middle of something, you know, of like a family event or something, or some kind of other activity, and then do 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 do, and it's like Spoon bill, seen on the river tour. I gotta go, you know, and and they just <laughs> leave whatever they're doing. He goes, Do you take the battery as your lawful? Do, 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 do. Where did we hang on? Spoon bill, you know, that, see, that to me, that's a twitcher. That's someone for whom spotting a bird, seeing a rare bird, is they're usually rare birds. It, it, it takes precedence over their everything in their lives. And, and while there's something sort of quaintly, I suppose, quite British about that, <laughs> I'm not quite at that level yet. Um, I, I tell you why. I mean, it's not just that. I mean, I'm being quite facetious there. But the, the, the serious point is that um, I think Twitchers tend to focus on the rarities and the exotics. And these are the birds that they only focus on, you know, the, the, the birds that you hardly ever see in Britain that are blown in by a storm or by some sort of strange confluence of circumstance. And so therefore they are some, you know, it, it's a bit of a sort of, you know, a, 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 an event. It's a, it's an excitement in, in the, in the twitching world. But for me, you know, I get as much pleasure from seeing common everyday birds. To me, birding is about getting pleasure from seeing birds out and about being in the countryside. And so it doesn't really, it doesn't follow that I would have to see an exotic, but of course, if you see one, that's great. It's all even more exciting, but I'm just as happy, you know, watching cormorants on the Thames or watching herons. I'm just as happy, you know, watching the jay at the bottom of my garden, listening to the wren, you know, having a conversation, listening to the robins, you know, just watching even pigeons, even just the most common bird, probably that you could imagine seeing it certainly in a city context just their aerodynamism their, their skill at flying and the sudden burst of activity all of that just kind of it it softens the urban landscape in a way that i just find them to be as as marvelous and as 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 sort of nourishing to the soul as you know, seeing a rare warbler. <laughs> Where do you think the nightingale gets its song? Ah, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, the nightingale is, is often sort of lauded as one of the great songs of all our birds, certainly in Britain. 
uh, I was I was listening to the Nightingale song actually because I was I, I was I wrote a piece of music which was based around the song of the wren, and I've got to say there's a lot of similarities there. <laughs> you know, there's this kind of it's almost this sort of mechanical mixed with the tune falls. There's a and then you know there's this sort of almost jerky random combina combination of sort of mechanical sounds tuneful sounds and it sounds like to me it's like a bird doing an impression of another bird it's like you know it's like the birds going here's one for you right this is a wren right listen to this and it does an impression of it and that's what it sounds like to me it sounds like it's actually ripped off its song from the wren if you listen to the wren very similar and I think the, the wren is, you know, deserves royalties. <laughs> Some of your drawings reminded me of illustrations in the library's collections. Why do you think birds are such a source of inspiration for artists? Is it something to do with all the different characters? Um, well, yes, I mean, I think it is. I think that birds have been a huge inspiration for artists going back, you know, since people started to draw. I mean, if you look at some of the early coinage of, you know, the, the very first coins ever minted. And a lot of them have got bird design on them. Um, you know, it features on clothing and um, sort of in, in artworks and, and tapestries, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's like goes back centuries. Yeah. And, and I think we love to imbue, you know, animals with characters and I sort of and one of the things that's become a kind of feature of my um dvd covers was a kind of animal and human sort of crossover like I, you know I like the idea of of mythical beasts you know like a, one of the my shows was called part troll and the the dvd cover featured me in a sort of suit and a, bo a bowler hat like a sort of traditional British commuter, but I had a troll's tail and ears. And that was like, it came from the idea of the old Norse myth that trolls were able to, um, you, you know, sort of, they were able to inveigle their way into human society and pass themselves off as normal humans. But the, the tail was the thing that gave them away. And for me, always feeling slightly a bit out of the mainstream of society that sort of resonated with me very much like i've always tried to inveigle myself and appear normal amongst other humans so that was a, a good fit for me and then another one of them was a tinsel worm where i sort of had a kind of um a, my hair turned into sort of the kind of gossamer wings of a dragonfly it was quite a fanciful thing so the idea of some kind of human bird hybrid was something that is a feature of the illustrations in my book. In fact, one of them is a bill goose, which is a, a goose, but it has my face on my head, sort of padding around the room with slippers on, which uh, which I really liked. And I have this sort of, I know there's another one where I have this sort of vision, this strange dream where these these um, crows have got you know hugely grotesquely elongated legs and tiny bodies, and they're these figures of almost like nightmarish figures. So all of these, I, I mean, I absolutely love them. And um, I noticed that one of them here is, is that these are examples from uh, Beastury with extracts from Gerald of Wales and Beastury with extracts from Geraldus Cambrensis. Now, Geraldus Cambrensis <laughs> was a quite, a, I, I'm quite a fascinating character. I'm quite intrigued by him because he's the guy that came up with this complete, sort of myth this nonsense that barnacle geese came from barnacles and that's why they're called barnacle geese because of this guy Geraldus Cambrensis and I've actually got um, a quote of his which is one of the bonus facts in my book which accompanies the section on barnacle geese and and this is this is the bonus fact from that um, that section and it is uh, the first recorded instance of a goose from a shell which is what um, Geraldus claimed to have seen. This cobblers was from a bloke called Geraldus Cambrensis, who made this who made this unlikely claim in 1186. And this is a quote. He said, "I have seen with my own eyes more than a thousand of these small birds hanging from one piece of timber, enclosed in their shells." 
he lied. Why he wrote this, I don't know. Maybe he dreamt it, or perhaps he was a bit of a loner, just trying to get a girlfriend. Fair lady, these geese, they um, um, uh, come from barnacles. And she would reply, wow, I am impressed with your implausible yet amazing goose wisdom. We don't hear of many children going bird watching. One exception might be Dara McAnulty. How can we encourage more young people to get off their devices and out into nature? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And I think it's a general problem, isn't it, about trying to encourage people to go outside more and step away from the phone and maybe just switch off a little bit and just enjoy nature. And I think that, you know, certainly um, during these strange times, I think people have actually done exactly that. I think, you know, people listen to birdsong because of the, 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 the reduced amount of noise. People were aware of birdsong more. Um, and I think that people have had to get out and about and be creative in, in you know, exploring outside space. And I hope, hope that that will be one of, the, one of the things that we retain after we you know, get through all of this. Um, but specifically about birds, I mean, I've got to say, I think that the term bird watching might just have to be quietly sort of retired. <laughs> you know, I just think it doesn't really do justice to what I get from when I go out to see birds. It's not just bird watching. It's not just sort of a kind of, the sort of a passive kind of, look at that. Like you're just sitting in a cafe watching people, you know, like people watching, you just sit there with coffee and go, oh, look at him, oh, look at him. You know, it seems, for me, it's much more than that. You know, it, I think we should make, maybe not say that. I think that might put people off. I think, you know, the idea of bird watchers or twitchers has sort of got this kind of slightly, you know, strange, nerdy connotations. And actually, it should be more about exploration. It should be about an adventure of which birds are just a part. And I think that that's the way you do it. You know, when when I'm, when our, our son was younger, we would go on uh, trips out about and we would say we're going on a bit of an adventure and we're going for a walk in the woods and oh look and listen to that and then you know and so the bird was a kind of a, a bonus like a it was not the sole focus of the trip it was like well we're going to look at the plants and we're gonna look at the trees and we're going to be outdoors and we're going to have a little picnic and we're, we're going to be in the outdoors and, and while we're outdoors let's listen to that what is that what is that sound what is that bird what is it you know and make that part of the experience and I'm I'm here in New Zealand, luckily, I've been touring here and I've just, I, I spent some time on the South Island uh, of New Zealand and we were lucky enough to go to Stewart Island, which is a, um, Stewart Island has another little island off it called Ulva. And Ulva is one of these islands that New Zealand is sort of specialise in, these predator free uh, zones where because of the nature of the birds here, they're very fragile and they're you know prone to um, all kinds of predators as stoats and weasels and cats and rats, they've sort of set aside these areas where there are none of these things. So there's traps out. And so pretty much they're predator free. So these birds have a chance to kind of thrive. And, you know, it was just, we, we just walked around through native bush, listening to the sounds of these birds. And it just reminded me what it is about um, birds that I, that, that I find so extraordinary. And so it's so sort of, it speaks to me on many levels. It's not just about trying to tick off species. It's not just about sort of trying to sort of get a photograph of them, capture them, put them in a book. It's about, uh, it, it's, a, it's a way into lots of other things. It's about, well, why are they here? Why is this beautiful parrot, the kaka? Why does that live here? Why has it got these kinds of colors? How has it got here? Why is it that it's here? And look at this bird and what the rifleman why is it called that ah because it it rifles up the tree in a spiral way all oh, right and why has it done that and how has it got to that point and it's sort of like for me all of the the experience of seeing birds is are lots of doors into other avenues of curiosity and i think that's to me that would be what i would say to try and get more children involved 
and getting outdoors, there is there are all manner of doorways and opportunities to explore that are not just about seeing the bird, hearing the bird, finding out about why it is where it is, the trees that it live in, why has it lived here, the history of the woodland, why do these trees grow here and not somewhere else? How long have these birds been here? Can you imagine people hundreds of years ago listening to that exact bird? That's the thing I find fascinating. You know, you you listen to the sound, you know, like a great tit or something in in uh, in Britain. You know, you'll hear it in in the in your back garden, maybe. You know, you might hear a great tit, and then you realise, but this this was the this was. Anton Bruckner, you know, the Austrian composer, heard that and incorporated into in the into into his fourth symphony, you know. So it's it's almost like a a, a doorway into the past as well, you know. The birds don't change. The birds, I mean, they obviously there's sort of minor changes and minor little sort of tweaks of subspecies and so on. But pretty much, he would have heard the same bird that I'm hearing right now. And to me, that's like it connects us to the past. It's like a living connection to the past. It's like the modern day representation of a timeline which exists and goes back millennia. And so by experiencing the birds, you're experiencing history and geography and culture and art and our own place in the world. You know, there's, there's so much more you can gather from just one song. Thank you, that was great. Right, we've got questions coming in. Um, here's one for Sam from Mike, who says, Sam, has your singing been somehow influenced, do you think, by the singing of the nightingale or other birds? Oh, yes, without question. Um, I mean, I've always considered him to be the master singer and a great teacher. Um, and I think one of the greatest aspects of the Nightingale song is the, is the, is the decoration of silence and this ability for, the, for the, the males to really be able to kind of craft that amazing sense of the space, the quietness of the night. And um, as a folk singer who's learned my craft from some of the, the old singers, the old way of singing, uh, particularly you know, our native local uh, styles of singers from across the British Isles and Ireland as well. Um, there's a lot of similarity in that uh, with the unaccompanied voice about how you use the silence to create suspense and tension and invite the listener to uh, bring their own ideas, orchestration, their own arrangements into the space. So I find that the, the Nightingale has taught me a lot about the invitational aspect of singing to, to, to lure the listener into the experience to, in some ways, to co-create co the song together. Uh, the next question I'm going to put to Helen, it's from Audrey Jarvis, and she talks about the 2021 RSPB Garden Bird Watch report, uh, which says that over the last 50 years, 40 million birds have vanished from the UK. Do you think there's any chance of recovery from such a loss or at least a way to halt further losses? Yeah, it's a terrifying statistic. I mean, you know, it's pretty much my lifetime and that's that's what's disappeared. And, and you know, it's, you know, I, I used to sort of, you know, giggle about grown ups talking about, you know, in my day, it was all fields. And now I look back and I, you know, try and tell younger people about what it was like to see vast flocks of lapwings. You know, when I was a kid, they were everywhere and they've gone. I mean, it's it's hard to try and communicate what's lost. Um, I think there's hope. Um, there are a whole bunch of examples of what happens if you if you let nature do its thing. It's extraordinarily resilient. Um, the Nepa uh, estate in, in in Sussex, for example, has nightingales in breeding in places that you know one wouldn't expect nightingales to be. Um, if you if you're careful um, and you manage to maintain corridors between good habitats, there's all sorts of good things that that can happen. And I know at the moment there's a big drive to um, not only preserve uh, really kind of ecologically rich habitats, but also like you know purchasing land that can be turned back to rewild into habitats and bring stuff back. But it's 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 tough. I mean, you know, we're competing against. Um, 
a lot of other interests, you know, agriculture is, is hard. Uh, there are some very enlightened farmers, but generally agribusiness is really sucky for the natural world. And climate change is terrifying too. You know, a lot of the insect um, loss that we've we've suffered is, you know, the magnitude of that is, is phenomenally frightening. And a lot of that is, is to do with chemical pesticides, but also climate change. You know, the temperature changing is, 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 a, is, a, is a great obstacle for, for the continued health of those populations. So, you know, we have to work really hard on an enormous number of fronts. And it's hard, it's quite easy to get discouraged, but there are so many passionate people um, doing extraordinary things that I think, it's, I think we have to, we owe it to every, everyone and everything to, to, to main, maintain hope and keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is another one for Sam from Harry Armfield. Um, he says, your description of a Nightingale get together captured mine and my wife's romantic imagination. Where can we enjoy such a gathering? Oh. I think that leads on to your, is it the Nest Collective? That's Well, yes, the, um, indeed that I run uh, gatherings throughout April and May, the Singing with Nightingales experiences which bring musicians and an audience into, into the forest. As, and if you can reach Sussex, where we do them down just outside of Lewis, uh, please do. Um, there are nightingales all over the Southeast and I implore people to, to not need me to be their guide, but if you want to come and have time around the fire and hear more of the stories and, uh, and hear some of the folk songs, particularly in some guest musicians, um, it really is a wonderful way of creating a sort of ritual for the bird and uh, falling under the nightingale's spell. Um, so the Nest Collective run these events. Uh, you can find on their website and there are just a few places around the campfire left for this year. <laughs> right, so sign up quick. Uh, this one is from Helen and it's to both of you. She wants to know how you write about nature do you write as you walk for example or immerse yourself in the moment and then relive that experience when writing later helen do you want to say it first it varies um so sometimes i'll be doing something and something will just snag on my attention you know something will kind of come out of the background gray and green and really i'll think what is that it's often curiosity it's often something that happens that i'm like why is why is that why why is why do i have an emotional response to that why is that particular kind of um animal or or kind of combination of weather and, and light why does that draw me and i'll come back and it's writing an essay i think is a little bit like a, it's like a kind of crossword puzzle or, a, or some kind of you know, it's, it's, it's something you have to solve. And, and what I try and do is take that, that emotional charge that something has given me, and I try and unroll it and try and work out where those emotions come from, what their historical and social meanings are. I think it's really important for us to try and understand why we value some, some things in nature more than others and why, you know, what those valuations, where they come from. There's a lot of class and, you know, race and stuff tied up in the way we look at the natural world so part of my job I think is to try and unpack those hidden meanings and, and see where that takes us but mostly just do it with joy you know um, a lot of the time you go out there looking to, for inspiration you just get rained on and you get covered in mud and you come home swearing because that happens quite a lot. <laughs> Sam do you want to tell us about your process of writing? Oh, I, I mean, I'm sitting here with a, next to a master with you, Helen. And, I, you know, I, this is my first book and it came about really through the, the hard work of the Penguin team who have helped put tonight on with a, a series of whips and thumb screws that um, forced me into doing, doing this quite against my will. Of course, I loved it. And, um, and, and for the book, it was an incredible moment where all the, the worlds that I had sort of dipped my, my sort of my eyes and ears and uh, ideas into and the experience of the night I suddenly was like, ah, oh, this is material for a, a whole different way of storytelling. I'm a, I'm a singer. I'm a, I, I write, I do write songs or I sing folk songs, but um, nature has been my greatest inspiration for my for my songs, very much so. And uh, often find that I may, if I can speak of the songs, that spending extended amounts of time and really taking my um, my inquisitiveness into nature. That's that that's for me where my muse is. I do most of my writing for songs out in out in the field, um, often in trees. Actually, I find myself climbing beaches 
and uh, and field oaks quite to, to really kind of separate myself from the kind of the ground and um, and and certain species will often come and and help me out. I certainly the ones the lead one song on my last album came that the, the title album came from a, a buzzard coming and really kind of saving my life at one point uh, when taking a really a real problem life kind of crisis moment about my relationship with nature and a buzzard just appeared dropped out of the sky and started singing to me crying out right above my head swirling around just a few meters above and uh and you know those are the moments where sometimes that you know you you kind of the muse comes to you uh and and nature has got such a, a a responsiveness if you're if you're there ready and listening and waiting with sometimes with pen in hand sometimes not sometimes you have to write it in your head and remember it till you get back to the, the pen and ink well, I think that's a good uh, note to end on. We're going to have to wrap up, um, but I'd like to thank um, all our three panellists and also to thank Penguin Live and the British Library. And just to remind you that you can buy all of the books of these authors. Uh, you'll see the details at the bottom of the screen. And um, I hope you enjoyed this evening's event. <laughs>